given a purpose. the sixth and uh, final message of this series, Words Matter. And I want to begin this morning where we left off last week. Last week, you'll remember that we looked at that classic verse from Ephesians about our words. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who who hear. Remember last week we saw in this verse the radical transformation that God wants to bring to your words so that your words go from corrupting words to words that impart grace. Listen, that's a radical transformation from corruption to grace. God wants your mouth and the words that you speak to be tools or instruments in his hands that he might do his redemptive work in the lives of others. Now, your mouth, we said last week, is a gift. It is a gift. Think about it. There's a child in your life, quite possibly, who needs to know that they are made by God and for God They need to know that God loves them and that Jesus died to be their Savior. They need to know that. And your mouth may be the tool, the instrument in the Redeemer's hands to speak the words of truth that they hear. Your mouth is a gift. Think about it. You may have a coworker or a neighbor or a classmate Someone near you in your life that needs to hear that God loves them, that Jesus Christ died to reconcile them to God. And your mouth is the instrument that the Redeemer will use to impart words of grace to that person. Your mouth is a gift. Don't forget that. Your mouth is a gift. And I want to continue on today with your mouth and the words you speak as a gift to others and as a tool in the Redeemer's hands. But today for the message, the star of the show, so to speak, is not going to be your mouth. It's going to be your feet. And you say, well, that sounds strange. Your feet are kind of a long way from your mouth, wouldn't you say? So we're going from your mouth to your feet. I want, to see the rela- want you to see the relationship between those two. Not that you put your foot in your mouth. That's not what I'm talking about. I want you to see the relationship between your mouth and your feet as instruments in the Redeemer's hands. So I want you to turn to Romans chapter 10 this morning. Turn to Romans chapter 10. This last week, three of us from the staff here attended the annual meeting of the association our church is part of. And I went to this sort of round table like workshop, which is sort of back and forth, you know, with the instructor. And toward the end, someone asked a question, basically, what, what, what do you see as the real purpose of all of this? And I, I like what he responded, uh, Claire Jewell, our teacher, 
in that hour. He responded this way. He said, the purpose is this, to decrease the amount of lostness in your city. That's what all of this is about, is to decrease the amount of lostness in your city. Do you want that? Do you want that? Do you want that person who's typing those words, that that video, sermon video is saying? Do you want that person to hear and to know God and Jesus Christ? The person who's asking if anyone loves them, the person who's asking them if asking if they're ugly, if they're a disappointment, if they're a loser, wouldn't you want them to hear and to know that God loves them, that they're rescued and given a purpose? To decrease the amount of lostness. Let's think about that as we look at the word this morning. Romans chapter 10, let me read verses 14 through 17. If you would stand once you found your place, if you're able, stand with me as I read God's word. Romans chapter 10 and verse 14. You follow along in your Bible. The word of God reads like this. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they've not all believed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word this morning, and I ask that you join me in prayer as we ask God to help us to see and to receive this word today. Father, this is your holy and true word that we have read, that we have heard, and that now, Father, we are praying that your spirit will plant within our hearts. Father, some who hear this message need to call, to believe and call. Others need to go and proclaim. And so, Father, whatever the response is you have for us today, help us to see it. Help us to receive it by faith. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Now, I want to look at this text this morning and talk, first of all, about how faith happens. How faith happens. Or you might say how God creates faith. But from our perspective, there's a point in time in which you don't believe, and now you do believe, so faith has happened. How does that work? How does God work to produce faith in you or in the heart of someone? And that's really what the Apostle Paul is addressing here. So there's five parts. The first you'll notice is the last part that Paul mentions, which is sending or going. Uh, Later on, we're going to talk about the the relationship between sending and going. But there's sending or going is where it begins. Then there's proclaiming. After proclaiming, there's hearing. And then hearing, there's believing. And believing, there's calling. So we're going to start at the end, which is where Paul starts, with the calling upon the Lord. Notice verse 14. How then will they call on him? Let's talk about what it means to call on him. In the context here, calling on him is defined for us. It's defined for us, first of all, back in 13, verse 13, where it says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So calling upon the Lord has something to do in relationship to being saved. It's defined even more, though, back in verses 9 and 10. Kind of working our way backwards, but if you go back to verse 9, you'll see that If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So this calling on the Lord, verse 14, is the same thing. In essence, it's the same thing as the confession of Christ as Lord back in verse 9 and verse 13. Calling upon the Lord, confessing the Lord. Now, there's, 
there is a nuance between the two that we're going to talk about, but in essence, they're the same act of faith. It's the same act of faith that calls upon the Lord that also confesses Jesus is Lord. Now, I say that in essence, they're the same thing for three reasons. Because in these verses, both calling and confessing, or maybe I should say confessing and calling because confessing said first, both confessing and calling are related to believing, they're then related to lordship, and then they're related to salvation. You see in the text, first of all, where both confessing and calling are related to believing. You call upon the Lord because you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. There's the connection there. And then verse 14, how will you call upon him in whom you have not believed? So there's the connection between calling and believing. So both confession and calling are in relation to believing. Same thing is true of lordship. You confess Jesus as Lord and you call upon the name of the Lord. So both confessing and calling are related to lordship, and in the same way, then, they're related to salvation, because it's as you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And then it is calling upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So they're both related to the idea of salvation as well. So confession and calling related to believing, to lordship, and to salvation. So you might ask, well, then why do they use different words? And they are different words, by the way. The word confess, the word calling, they're two entirely different words. So you say, why would, they use two di- why would Paul use two different words if he's in essence saying the same thing? I think the answer to that is that there is something to be gained from the use of two different words. And this is what I think that Paul would be meaning and that God the Spirit would want for us in using these two words. Let's look at the word confess to begin with. Homo legio or homo legeo is the Greek word. You'll see that there's two words, compound word, homo, same, and legio, legeo, which means word. There's the root word in that word, which is logos. Jesus, you know, is the In the beginning was the Word, referring to Jesus, the Word of God or the Logos of God. So in essence, this word confession means to say the same thing, or it means to agree. It means to acknowledge. So when you confess Jesus as Lord, you're agreeing with God. You're agreeing with what has been revealed about Jesus, that He is Lord. To confess Jesus as Lord, I'm not Lord, you're not Lord, He's not Lord, she's not Lord, there's one Lord, and that is Jesus. I think it's so important because we confess He is Lord because the Jesus you believe in matters. It's not not just a Jesus that you fashion in your own image or that you create in your own mind. I've said it so many times, but Jesus is not a Mr. Potato Head you know, where you stick what eyes you want on, and the ears you want, and the mouth you want, that you just kind of shape Jesus in your own image? No, He is Lord. And to acknowledge that is to agree with what God has said about Him. So that's confessing Him as Lord. Now, calling is an entirely different word. Epikaleo is the compound word that is the word that's translated calling here, has the idea of asking, kaleo, epi, for help or assistance. So it basically means to call out for help. So this word, calling, we call upon the Lord, which is an acknowledgement of our need for His salvation. So I think that the confession, confession, calling, are describing the same act of faith, but just a little different. You might think of confession is like um, man word. It's like the confession we make before others that Jesus is Lord. And calling is God word. We call upon the Lord in recognition to God that we need and believe in Jesus. So this, this creation of faith, or the way faith happens ends with 
calling upon the Lord. Now, how can you call, though, on the one that you have not believed? And so, secondly, let's talk about believing from verse 14. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Now, in calling, I acknowledge who Jesus is and that I need him. In believing, here's a word that's describing both my confidence and trust in what Jesus has done for me in order to save me and to bring me to God. You see, there's content in believing. There's objective truth about who Jesus is and what he has done that I must believe. But believing is also conveying the fact that not only do I just mentally comprehend and accept it, but I believe it. I trust it. I trust it or I believe it in a way in which I receive it. I receive what Jesus Christ has done. So, in believing on him, we call upon him. Believing communicates my heart's trust in what Jesus has done in being sufficient to save me. So, what is it the truth, then, that we must believe? Well, the truth is that Jesus died for our sins and that he rose again from the grave. Look back at verses 19 and 10 together now. Verses 19 and 10 If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You see, every one of us have two spiritual problems that we cannot fix on our own. Two spiritual problems that we are absolutely helpless to fix on our own. The first is our sin. The problem of sin and the consequences of that sin. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. Separation from God. Separation from the fellowship of God. uh, Ultimate separation or eternal death being separated from God under the judgment of God. The first spiritual problem that you and I have that we cannot fix on our own is our sin problem and the consequence of that sin. The second problem is that you and I lack righteousness. We lack a righteous standing before God. It's not just a matter of having your sins forgiven, but we need to be made right. We need to be made righteous that God might accept us. Two needs that we have. One, sin. Two, righteousness. Jesus Christ fully accomplishes both for us. He goes to the cross in our place, and there he takes in himself the judgment we deserve. We've broken God's law. We deserve to die, but Christ steps in our place and takes that death for us. We have incurred God's wrath because of our sin. Jesus, in our place on the cross, receives. It's like he absorbs the wrath of God that you deserve, that you might be forgiven of your sin. Jesus stands in our place and provides for us at the cross of Calvary what we need for our sins to be forgiven. He also there provides for us his righteousness. His righteousness becomes available to us because he lives and dies in our place. If you study the larger context of Romans chapter 10, righteousness of Christ is the issue that Paul is talking about here. Two things Jesus does for us. He solves the sin problem by dying in our place, removing the wrath of God, and he provides for us a perfect righteousness in which we can stand accepted by God. That's what we must believe. That's what he's done for us, that we would believe. And having believed, we acknowledge them to God by calling upon him and are saved. This is how faith happens. This is how God creates faith. Now let's go back one more. Number three, hearing. Because you'll notice also in verse 14, the second part of verse 14, how will they believe in him in whom they have never heard. Let me talk about two or three things here about this, about this hearing. First of all, hearing is not 
just necessarily talking about the physical reaction that's actually happening in your ear when you hear something. You know what I'm talking about? I don't. I just know it works. I'm not just talking, though, about how that works. Certainly, it might be that someone preaches something, they proclaim something, and you do hear it with your ear. But the idea of hearing here goes beyond that. Hearing is just the message getting into your mind. So you may hear it as someone with your ears, as someone speaks a message. You could hear with your eyes as someone signs a message. You could also hear with your eyes as you read a text. You could hear with your fingertips as you read Braille. So the point isn't just physical hearing. The point is the message getting into your mind. God has ordained that his, his, the way in which you would believe and therefore call is that the message of the gospel would get into your mind. That's why he uses the word here, hearing. Notice God's ordained means by which you would believe is that you hear. It's not just something that you feel, but it's something that you hear. Hearing is more objective than just something merely that you feel. So it's hearing, not just feeling. Now listen, there's, there's a relationship certainly between hearing, believing, calling, and feeling. There's a great book. If you want to really read an excellent book on this, get John Piper's book that's simply entitled Think. And in that book, he brings together the idea of what you think in your mind and believe, then how that affects your heart, how you feel, your affections, your desires. There's certainly a connection. But God's method for you to get the gospel into your mind is by hearing. Now, something, though, about this hearing that's very important, I think maybe the most important thing about hearing. Hearing communicates to us that the message we need is something that's outside of us, and then it comes to us. It's something that God imparts to us, but it's a message that's from without. You see, you'll never be saved if you follow the Eastern and Eastern religion that has you look within yourself to try to find salvation and identity within. If all you ever do is look within, you will be lost. Because the message of the gospel is something that God imparts to us. It comes from God. I think that's why God's ordained means by which we would believe and then call is by hearing. Because hearing is telling us that there's something outside of us. There's a message outside of us that has to come to us. It's imparted to us by God. So calling, believing, hearing. Let's go now to the fourth, which is proclaiming. Still in verse 14, the end of verse 14. How are they to hear without someone preaching or proclaiming? I like to say proclaiming because the word here, preaching, is a word that literally means to herald something, to proclaim something. Sometimes we think about preaching too technically. We're like, Pastor Duke is preaching right now. I don't preach. It's more than that. It's a herald. So in this day, if the emperor wanted a message to get to a city, he would send a herald. That herald would go to the city, go to the public square, and they would cry out the message that comes from the king or that comes from the emperor. That's what it is here. This word simply means a herald, someone who's in the city square who's crying out the message. So how are they going to hear unless there be someone who's a proclaimer, unless there's someone who's crying out this message? His means of getting the message into your mind is someone proclaiming a message to you. And then that leads us then back to the sending or the going. Verse 15, how are they to preach unless they're sent? Now, let me ask you, the answer to this is very easy. This is not a trick question, but who's the sender? God is, right? God is the one who sends. God sends a proclaimer. That proclaimer proclaims, proclaims a message to a hearer, 
so that the hearer might believe and then call upon the name of the Lord. So there's really three parties that are involved here. It begins with God. God's the sender. It's God's message. And then we'll say you are the second part. If you're a Christian, you're hearing this message, you're the second part of this because now you are the proclaimer. You're the one who's proclaiming a message. And then the third is the hearer, the hearer who hears the message and believes, and then they call to the Lord. So you can kind of see how this comes full circle. What starts with God ends with God as someone calls upon the Lord and is saved. But here's what I want you to see. Here's the key to this, and this is really the crux of the matter for this message this morning. There's something clearly implied between God's sending and a message being proclaimed. Because God isn't just sending a message, he's sending a messenger. What is clearly implied here is your obedience. You go because you're sent. So between the sending and the proclaiming, there has to be going. And that going is your obedience. Now what is implied here becomes real clear in verse 15 when Paul reaches back to Isaiah and pulls for pulls forward Isaiah 52 7 which says how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news now that just sounds strange your feet don't preach so why does Isaiah say it that way why does Paul pull those words forward because your feet represent obedience your feet represent obedience God sends And you, in obedience, go. And the way you go is by way of the instrument of your feet. You're going. Obedience is required before the proclaiming. So your feet represent your obedience to God. That is why your feet in going are beautiful to God. Because your going feet... You're taking the gospel is God's means of others hearing and believing and calling. So you go, you're obedient. The mouth speaks the message, but it's the feet that carry the messenger. Verse 17 kind of wraps it all together. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. Now, there's one of two responses for each of us this morning who are hearing this message, and the first response is this. Your response to this may be a believing and calling response. If you have not believed and called upon the name of the Lord to be saved, that's your response to this text today. God is calling you to believe and to call upon him and be saved. Maybe you could think of it this way. Let's think that, just for illustration's sake, you fall into this deep hole that you can't get out of. You try crawling up the sides, but the sides are just too steep. You, you can't get out of it. And in desperation, you sort of collapse at the bottom of this hole in the recognition that you are absolutely helpless to get out of this hole. And if you don't get out of this hole, you're eventually going to be a goner. Now, let's say that in your despair, you look at the top of the hole, and there you see someone standing there with a rope. Now, right away, as you see this rope, right away in your mind now, you know what that rope is. And let's say you're able to to, uh, deduce in your mind that that rope is adequate to save you. So what do you do? You're absolutely helpless. You see that there's a means by which someone who has a rope and someone who's strong enough to pull you out, so what do you do? You call, right? You say, help. You say, drop the rope. You say something to help to, that this person would recognize that you want 
to receive the rope. And so they drop the rope and they pull you out to safety. This is the relationship between believing. It's like God stands with a message of a Savior, one who died for your sins that you might be forgiven. You couldn't do that on your own. You couldn't earn forgiveness. One who gives you perfect righteousness. You couldn't make yourself righteous. And here is God who stands with this means of salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you see that in your desperation, you believe it, and you say, Lord, please give me. Re I, I want to receive what you have, what you've provided for me in Christ. So you believe it, and then with your mouth, you confess, you call upon the Lord and are saved. So maybe you're here this morning, you're hearing this message. Your response is one to believe and to call. Would you do that today? Maybe the response that you have for this message is to go and proclaim. You need to see from this message this morning that your feet and mouth are instruments in the Redeemer's hands. God sends, but we must go. That going may be across the street. That going may be on the break, someone sitting next to you. Or that going may be someplace around the world. I'll tell you a word that really stood out to me as we were reading this scripture this morning is back in verse 14 when he says, how will they believe if they have never heard? That makes me think about unreached people groups in this world. Because there are those who have never heard. Never heard. Maybe your response today is to go and to proclaim. I really want us as a church to give ourselves to going and proclaiming. Again, as I think about whoever that person is, typing all of those things in, looking for an answer. Who am I? Am I loved? Does anyone care? Am I a loser? Am I ugly? my disappointment oh how we want them to know that they are loved in Christ they are rescued and given a purpose for life don't you want them to know that let's go and tell let's go and proclaim as God's people as his instruments